Welcome to the Vimalakirti Experience. I'm MC Owens, and we're off. Um, this is part seven, the, the, the penultimate uh, of the experience, the, the second to last class here. And um, so uh, now that we're seven classes in, a lot, a lot has taken place. Um, and so as usual, I'm going to bring us back up to speed. I, I need to recap the story. There's just so many things. Um, don't tune out, though, because I'm going to recap it in a whole new way, uh, like all new things I'm going to tease out from the past. Uh, but one thing I thought would be nice, even though it's a risk on my part, um, and so I'm actually going to ask you just to sort of like hear this out and maybe not try to ask any questions about this just because it's like a preliminary thing and i'm kind of i'm gonna call this a uh, a little tathagata shot we were talking about our little vinegar tonic shots a second ago these little wake me ups little whoop so i want to give us a little tathagata shot um so this is sort of really relevant to the chapter it's been really relevant to the whole sutra michael taft referenced it in his meditation on thursday night and i wanted to just kind of piggyback off of that and mention that. And it's this word, tathagata or tathagata. Really, really simply, again, this is just a little shot. So we're just gonna do it real quick. It's just another word for the, a title for the Buddha. World honored one, Buddha, enlightened one, great teacher, tathagata. So when you hear it, you can translate it as Buddha in your mind. However, really quickly, I do want to give you a little background on it. And again, this is sort of a philosophical shot to sort of prime our minds for some ideas that are going on. Um, the, the root of the word here is tathata. Tathata. T-A-T-H-A-T-A. Tathata. And it's a word that means suchness, as it isness things kind of as they are and in particular they're referring to in the present like what the, what is thus behold the zoom behold right what is in front of you the thusness in front of you right and there's a very well there's a lot i could be here all night talking about tathata -ta, suchness thusness as it isness the most important part about it, though, is that it's this idea that the only way to touch <laughs> tathata is to look at what's in front of you. There is no other suchness, no other thusness, no, no other tathata than behold what is in front of you. There is no past in this tathata, there is no future in this tathata, and there's arguably no present because the present would be some concept of time relative to past and future. And we're talking about actual absolute presence thusness. That's tathata. So then it gets very interesting in Buddhism. And by the way, this term, this, this title, tathagata, for the Buddha, it is the old, it's as early as old as it gets. So this is not some Mahayana fancy smancy stuff. This is the original way of thinking of enlightenment in the Buddha. So if you take that tathata and turn it, turn it into a person, you get tathagata. Roughly translated as thus come, thusly gone. The most important part about it for tonight's talk, though, is that uh, Michael Taft referenced the, it's the, the classic etymology of Tathagata, which is that it actually has a slippery, a slippery dual etymology where it can mean thus come, meaning like thusly come, thusly arrived, behold, <laughs> or thusly gone. And in that sense, it's kind of referring to that he's sort of not around anymore, sort of kind of maybe. But I want to just preface this idea that the Tathagata in the Mahayana tradition and what we're doing tonight, it's always about this presence. And so I'm going to give you a, a nice, sweet, uh, middle path etymology. And this is totally consistent with all etymology of Tathagata. 
Again, it's this slipperiness, tathagata or tathagata, and this kind of thus come, thus gone. But there's this third one, agata, can mean like, emer like emerging. Like if you imagine a, a fish emerging out of the water, that's agata. And so what a tathagata is, is emerging out of that tathata I just talked about. Emerging out of the thusness is tathagata, is the Buddha. And so this tathagata, this idea of the thus come one, the reason why I'm starting here with this quick shot of thusness, suchness, as it isness, is that well, we're talking, we're, when we're, we're talking about these Tathagatas, and tonight we're going to be talking about multiple Tathagatas. And I want you to know that, yes, in the form of a story, we're talking about the past. We're talking about history. We're talking about the Buddha 2,500 years ago. But what Tathagata, in the, especially in the Mahayana tradition, kind of really gets to is this idea that when we are talking about the Dharma and we're talking about the Buddha, and I keep saying this word, Tathagata, Tathagata, that is the Tathagata. This, this presence of the Dharma, this, this, this thus come one, that again, the only way to have this Dharma is be, to be present. The other, all those other millions and billions of people that haven't tuned into the Zoom, right? They're not hearing this Tathagata Dharma, right? So this is a special night. So on that note about Tathagata and this present, the, the present Tathagata, I'm going to retell where we're at in the story through one of our main characters. And in fact, besides Vimalakirti, the star of the show, this monk, Shariputra, is sort of the other star. He appears practically in every chapter. He, he kicks the whole thing off. And so what I want to do is quickly retell you, really quickly, five, ten minutes, tops. Retell you where we're at in the story, but through Shariputra's point of view. And I think it's really helpful to take his point of view and walk through how we got to where we are tonight. So... I started this whole Vimalakirti experience off actually before we even started talking about the Vimalakirti Sutra by introducing what I was uh, kind of, uh, you know, tongue in cheek, I was calling the Anathapindika Code. And Anathapindika was this great donor of the Buddha. He appears in all the old sutras. He kind of epitomizes giving, dana. In Buddhism, he was the great donor, supporter of the Sangha and all of that. And I read, right before we started this Vimalakirti Sutra, I read the Anathapindika Sutra, in which Anathapindika is ill. He, he's actually dying. And so the Buddha says to Shariputra, Hey, Shariputra, why don't you go check on Anathapindika and see how he's doing? And what's interesting about that sutra is that Shariputra says, yeah, right away, my Lord. And he, Shariputra goes to see Anathapindika. And the whole sutra is actually Shariputra teaching Anathapindika some higher dharma, actually originally dharma that wasn't meant for lay people. Shariputra sort of crossed a line and taught this uh, higher dharma, abhidharma, to Anathapindika. And so that's a very interesting sutra to reference when we are introduced in this sutra to Shariputra. Now, in this sutra, of course, Shariputra is coming to represent the Shravakas. This word, that means voice hearer, right? That's what Shravaka means, voice hearer. And there's, I've mentioned this, there's a lot of different ways to interpret what this word means. Simply put, it's a word for the disciples, the early followers of the Buddha. Yeah. He, voice hearer. Yeah, usually translated as they heard the voice of the Buddha. They actually heard the teachings, right? They were like the apostles of Jesus where they actually heard what Jesus said, not the later people, but the actual voice hearers. 
But I didn't take that initial excursion into Tathata and Tathagata for nothing. And so the another idea of a Shravaka, a voice hearer, is the one that hears that voice of the Tathagata, the one I was talking about a moment ago, the present voice of the Dharma, the present voice of the teachings. And all of a sudden, if you kind of follow me on that kind of Shravaka level, what starts to happen from a kind of pedagogical point of view, almost upayak, a skillful means point of view, is that when you're hearing a sutra, you're a voice hearer. <laughs> you're hearing about it. You're Shariputra. <laughs> and so indeed, there is a way to read these sutras where, that, where in the beginning of these, Shariputra is indeed a character. But then you slowly start to assume the position of Shariputra, the voice hearer, and then hopefully go along for the ride, right? And so let's say that you're Shariputra, you're a monk, a renunciant of the old school, you know, wander the earth, beg for your food, no sex, kind of a monastic. You're Shariputra, the marshal of the law. And you're hanging around in the Amrapali garden, right? And it's, it's, you're in Lichavi. And all of a sudden, these 500 Lichavi show up and make offerings to the Buddha. Pretty standard things to happen, you know? But then all of a sudden, the Buddha transforms those little umbrella parasols, all 500 of them, into one giant parasol covering the entire universe. Shariputra is pretty impressed by this, right? This miracle of the Buddha. And he hears this discourse about Buddha lands, Buddha Kshetra, Buddha fields, right? And that's sort of the, the, the intro to this. And there's a funny, you know, thing going on with Shariputra where he's sort of like be really bedazzled by this, um, well, this spectacle of uh, under the parasol. And well, to speed it up, what happens is, is that in the second chapter, we hear that there's this guy, Vimalakirti, a lay person of Vishali, who's sick, just like Anathapindika. And so just like the Anathapindika Sutra, the Buddha turns to you, Shariputra, first and says, hey, mister, I like going in and checking up on people and telling them all about the Dharma. Why don't you go check up on Vimalakirti? Now, Shariputra, who's first in line here for this, he politely declines and he reports back to everybody that he once ran into Vimalakirti while he was meditating under a tree. Uh, Shariputra was meditating under the tree. And Vimalakirti tells him, don't meditate like that in specific spaces at specific times with your little timer. You should always be in meditation, all this. And so, Vimalakirti blows Shariputra's mind. And so Vimalakirti says, you know, I don't really think I'm going to, I'm not up for going to, to see him. And then Shariputra watches one by one, all of his buddies, all the great disciples also politely refuse to go see Vimalakirti. Then the Buddha starts asking all the bodhisattvas to go. And you're Shariputra watching one by one, even the bodhisattvas, all the way up to Maitreya say, no, thank you, I politely decline. And then you watch the king, the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, finally step up and agree politely to the Buddha's request to go see Vimalakirti. And so you are like, woo! And you and the gang and Manjushri and all the bodhisattvas head over to Vimalakirti's house. But before you get there, Vimalakirti does his big magic trick where he makes his whole house empty. And everybody files into this house of emptiness in which there's Vimalakirti on his bed. And Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma, he asks a really good question. <laughs> it's the question really that Shariputra had on his mind that he would have asked had Manjushri not gotten there first, which is that Manjushri asks Vimalakirti, why is your house empty? <laughs> What's up with your house? <laughs> and of course, it's in that crucial chapter five that we get our discourse about emptiness. All things are empty. 
you go back, listen to chapter five. That's the idea of that chapter. As we go ahead, we get to the next chapter, chapter six. Now that we're understanding of this house of emptiness, it is Shariputra who asks this famous question, which is like, where are we supposed to sit in this house of emptiness, right? And this sort of initiates this, well, you know, first of all, of course, Shariputra gets schooled a little bit by Vimalakirti. Did you come here for the Dharma? Did you come here to sit down? Somebody who's really interested in the Dharma isn't interested in the chair. He's not even interested in his own body, let alone a chair. You know, he goes on and on and on. And then he says, okay, Shariputra, hold on a second. And he says to Manjushri, Manjushri, you've been to Buddha lands, incalculable Buddha lands. Where have you seen the best thrones? And, and Manjushri says, there's a Buddha land to the east of here. Hundreds of thousands of, of light years, I don't even know, called Meru Devajya, the uh, Mount Meru Banner, where the Buddha is basically as tall as a mountain, his bodhisattvas are as tall as mountains, and they sit on these giant thrones. And that, the Tathagata in that land called Meru Devajya, he sends over. <laughs> all of these gigantic thrones and fills Vimalakirti's once empty house with these giant thrones. And the bodhisattvas are all able to grow their bodies and sit on these giant thrones, but not the monks, not the shravakas. And so it's in that chapter, the inconceivable liberation chapter, that Vimalakirti teaches the monks, these eight liberations, he actually teaches, he doesn't, it's tricky because he doesn't really teach them. The sutra just tells us that he taught them. But there's these liberations that then allow these monks to transcend the physical limitations of their body and grow. And I did a lot of talking that night about, you know, what those thrones might represent in terms of sovereignty, personal sovereignty, self-sovereignty, and, you know, I just, I really want you to kind of start to get into this, like, oh, this nice groove of, of like this poetic groove that we're in, right? Where we're talking about this house that's made of emptiness and these chairs where it's like, well, in a house of emptiness, we could sit on anything we want, right? We could sit on giant thrones. We could sit on lotus petals. It's like, you know, once you've emptied it all out, you could kind of repopulate it with whatever you want in that way. And so that was sort of the message of that chapter was about this inconceivable liberation of the limitations of thought, <laughs> conceptualization itself. Thus, it's called the inconceivable, right? And that was kind of like a miracle, this bringing these thrones from this other world, this other dimension, and landing them in Vimalakirti's house, right? So then the following chapter, chapter seven, something even crazier happens, which is this goddess shows up and starts raining everybody with these magical flowers. And of course, this is a lot of fun, this chapter, the flowers don't stick to all the bodhisattvas, but they're kind of all sticking to Shariputra, right? And he's all like, eh, 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 like trying to get all these flowers off of him. And the, the goddess, of course, has to school Shariputra about his discriminative mind, where he's got all these hangups about adornments, or he's got all these hangups about gender and sexuality, or he's got all these hangups about who can and can't teach the Dharma. It's just all these hangups that these flowers kind of represent, right? And so this sort of brings me to now we're kind of getting caught up. We now understand maybe, you know, oh, how all these are tying together, these thrones and these flowers and all of that. And so really quickly, just to bring us right back up to speed, I'm going to start actually in chapter, I guess this is chapter seven. Yeah, the goddess chapter, chapter seven, on page 60 of the Thurman translation, if you're reading along. It's real brief, though. I actually skipped this. When I read it the first time, uh, read this chapter the first time, I skipped this portion because 
it, it would have like raised a bunch of questions that I couldn't answer that when I did it. But tonight, I want to read it because I'm introducing it tonight as it's the cipher. It's the cipher for the chapter tonight. That if, if we didn't remember this, or if we didn't read this, we didn't recall this, we might be lost, right? So again, this is the chapter where the goddess is schooling Shariputra about all of this. And after they've had a, a discourse and, and Shariputra has kind of come around to seeing exactly how wise this woman can be, the goddess says to him, uh, uh, this line, nevertheless, venerable Shariputra, just as one cannot smell the castor plant in a magnolia wood, but only in magnolia flowers, so Reverend Shariputra, living in this house, which is redolent with the perfume of the virtues of all qualities of the Buddha, one does not smell the perfume of the disciples, the Shravakas, and the solitary sages, the Pratekibhutas. Reverend Shariputra, the chakra gods, the Brahma gods, the Lokapala gods, the devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kimnaras, and maharagas who live in this house hear the dharma from the mouth of this holy man and enticed by the perfume of the virtues of the qualities of all Buddhas, they proceed to conceive the spirit of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. All right, that's all I wanna read. Now, I, I'm calling this the cipher because this is the connection. The flowers, what they represented in that chapter, right? They're so, I didn't, I only scratched the surface of the symbolism of the flowers in that chapter. I kind of stuck to the feminine, a little bit and all that, but there's just so many uh, uh, metaphors and analogies going on with the, the sense and all of that in that chapter, right? And so after the goddess really gave us that lesson in our discriminatory minds, after she dropped the cipher of the fragrances, the, these perfumes of the qualities of the Buddha, right? That's when we were introduced this idea of being, um, well, kind of being reborn in the family of the Buddhas, right? That was the family of the Buddhas chapter. I'm not going to go too into that because I do want to kind of get to tonight's chapter. In terms of the arc of the story, though, I do want you to kind of keep in mind that you know we've had these exciting chapters we've had these fun moments and the last chapter that we the, that we did entering the dharma door of non-duality where these 32 arguably 33 bodhisattvas give us these heavy hitting dharma doors of non-duality and it's it's kind of a heavy chapter you know, I'm not going to front, you know, it's like one after the next, after the next, all the way up to this exalted, you know, sp literally speechless point of ineffability, right? So I, in terms of the arc of all of this, I, I want you to know sort of that tonight is, the, it's the reward. It's the reward for all of your hard work. So it, tonight is, it's just a bedtime story. It really is. It's one of those things that we've done the work. We've already done all the work and now we just get to enjoy, right? And so on that note, Shariputra, uh, I'm starting on uh, page uh, 78. We're into chapter 10 now, folks. We're in new ground. And I'm not, I'm not well, I, I don't, I'm tempted to deal with this title. You know, and I know that some of you don't even have the book, so you don't even know. You don't even know what the title is. And so it's like, I wish I, you know, uh, half of me doesn't want to do this, but then half of me is like, ah, let me just do it now, right? Robert Thurman, I don't know. I don't have a Tibetan uh, version in front of me. I don't know actually where he's coming from with a lot of this stuff. He's kind of out of left field in a few places, or maybe the Tibetan is, I don't know. 
he titles this chapter 10, The Feast Brought by the Emanated Incarnation. Right? Can you say spoiler alert? Can, I mean, it's, it's really like, I, you know, so I want you to know I've referenced these Chinese versions that I'm constantly referring to. All three Chinese versions, including that one, the last one by the monk that walked all the way to India for 17 years to come back with the definitive edition. All three Chinese versions have the same title for this chapter. So they're pretty clear about what the title of this chapter is. And it's Suganda Kuta. Suganda Kuta. Uh, Ganda is a perfume or a scent. In Buddhism, they talk about Gandharavas, perfume eaters or scent eaters. They eat like incense and things like that. Interesting. Uh, the, the, uh, a, a big uh, proliferator, a big producer of such scents and perfumes was called Gandhara. Huh. Interestingly enough, right? What is today Afghanistan, Pakistan was called Gandhara, right? Could be a connection there. But this whole chapter tonight is all about this Ganda, scents, uh, fragrances, and not just, not just Ganda, Suganda, wonderful or beautiful scents, wonderful or beautiful smells. And then Kutas, Kuta, a Kuta, a pile, a mound. I haven't gotten into it, but this word kuta in Sanskrit, it literally means a peak, like a mountain peak. But the, the underlying meaning of it is so much so that it peaks, right? So you can imagine you have a little bit of rice and you have a mound. You get a little bit more rice and you've got a hill. But if you get enough rice, it'll peak. You'll get a peak. That's a kuta. And so it's a little tricky to translate it because it kind of means a pile or a mound because it's like a big mass of jewels, a ratna kuta, or a big mass of merit, a punya kuta, right? So it's a big mass, but the, but the metaphor is that it gets so big that it peaks. And that's what a kuta means is a peak. And so this is a, a mass or a peak of beautiful fragrances. That's the title of this chapter. Isn't that enticing, right? Just that idea. <laughs> Ooh, Suganda Kutta. Let's go. So thereupon, the Venerable Shariputra thought to himself, if these great bodhisattvas do not adjourn before noon, when are they going to eat? So remember, this is where are we going to sit, right? This is Mr. Where's your family at? Mr. All of that, right? So now his big question is, when are we going to eat? Michael's had us here for seven weeks, right? 49, seven times seven weeks. When are we going to eat, right? That's literally what he's saying is that we've been doing this for a while. And that last chapter was pretty heavy. When are we going to eat? And I might add, just to give you a little uh, 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 Tathagata layer, I would also encourage you to think of it as, what are we going to eat? So not just necessarily when, but what are we? Because remember, we're birthless now. We're deathless. We're, we've passed through the, the gateway, right? So we understand that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Tathagatas are dealing with the birthless and the deathless. And so that question of like, well, then where, are Buddha, where do Buddhas come from if they're neither born or not, where do they come from, right? Well, now it's this interesting question of, well, and what do they eat? So that's what's going on. Just like the flowers, just like the flowers sticking to Shariputra, there is also a very explicit um, reference going on here, of course, which is that monastics, Buddhist renunciants, 
have taken a vow traditionally to only eat one meal a day and to eat it before noon. So not to eat after midday. That's kind of a Buddhist rule. And so another thing that Shariputra is saying is, is that if we don't wrap this up soon, we're not going to be able to eat. So yet another hang up, right? Maybe Shariputra doesn't know about time zones, that it's noon somewhere, right? So ideas like that. So I just want you to know there's a lot going on with this question of like, when are the bodhisattvas going to eat? What are they going to eat? All of that, right? Knowing telepathically the thought of the Venerable Shariputra spoke to him thus, Venerable Shariputra, the Tathagata has taught the eight liberations. You should concentrate on those liberations, listening to the Dharma with a mind free of preoccupations with material things. Just wait a minute, Venerable Shariputra, and you will eat such food as you have never before tasted. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti set himself in such a rare concentration and performed such a miraculous feat that those bodhisattvas and those great disciples were enabled to see the world called Sarva Ganda Suganda, all beautiful sense, the accumulation of all beautiful sense, Sarva Ganda Suganda, which is located in the direction of the zenith, beyond as many Buddha lands as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers. There, the Tathagata named Suganda Kuta resides, lives, and is manifest. In that universe, the trees emit a fragrance that far surpasses all the fragrances, human and divine, of all the Buddha lands of the Ten Directions. In that universe, the designations disciple and solitary sage do not even exist. And the Tathagata Suganda Kuta teaches the Dharma to a gathering of bodhisattvas only. In that universe, all the houses, the avenues, the parks, and the palaces are made of various perfumes. And the fragrance of the food eaten by those bodhisattvas pervades immeasurable universes. At this very moment, the Tathagata Suganda Kuta sat down with his bodhisattvas to take his meal. And the deities called Ganda Vyuhahara, who were all devoted to the Mahayana, served and attended upon the Buddha and his bodhisattvas. Everyone in the gathering at the house of Vimalakirti were able to see distinctly this universe wherein the Tathagata, Suganda Kuta, and his bodhisattvas were taking their meal. The Lichavi Vimalakirti addressed the whole gathering of bodhisattvas. Good people, is there any among you who would like to go to the Buddha land to bring back some food for us? But, restrained by the supernatural power of Manjushri, none of them volunteered to go. The Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the crown prince Manjushri, Manjushri, are you not ashamed of such a gathering? Manjushri replied, Noble sir, did not the, the Tathagata declare those who are unlearned should not be despised. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Right? Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti, without rising from his couch, magically emanated an incarnation bodhisattva whose body was a golden color, adorned with the auspicious marks and signs, and of such an appearance that it outshone the whole assembly. The Lichavi Vimalakirti addressed that incarnated bodhisattva. 
noble one, go in the direction of the zenith. And when you have crossed as many Buddha lands as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers, you will reach a universe called Sarvaganda Suganda, where you will find the Tithagata, Suganda Kuta, taking his meal. Go to him, and having bowed down at his feet, make the following request of him. The Lichavi, Vimalakirti, bows down 100,000 times at your feet, O Lord, and asks after your health, if you have but little trouble, little discomfort, little unrest, if you are strong, well, without complaint, and living in touch with supreme happiness. Having thus asked after his health, you should request of him. Vimalakirti asks the Lord to give me the remains of your meal, with which he will accomplish the work of the Buddha in the universe called Saha. Those, thus, those living beings with inferior aspirations will be inspired with lofty aspirations. And the good characteristics and name of the Tathagata will be celebrated far and wide. At that time, the incarnated Bodhisattva said, Very good, to the Lichavi Vimalakirti and followed his instructions. In sight of all the Bodhisattvas, the incarnated Bodhisattva turned its face upward, facing the zenith, and was gone. And they saw the Bodhisattva no more. And when the incarnated Bodhisattva reached the universe of Sarganda Suganda, Sarvaganda Suganda, it bowed down at the feet of the Tathagata Suganda Kuta and said, Lord, the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti bowing down at the feet of the Lord greets the Lord saying, do you have little trouble, little discomfort, and little unrest? Are you strong, well, without complaint, and living in touch with supreme happiness? He then requests, having bowed down 100,000 times at the feet of the Lord, may the Lord be gracious and give to me the remains of your meal in order to accomplish the work of the Buddha in the universe called Saha. Then, those living beings who inspire to inferior ways may gain the intelligence to inspire to the great dharma of the Buddha, and the name of the Buddha will be celebrated far and wide. At that, the bodhisattvas of the Buddha land of the Tathagata, Suganda Kuta, were astonished and asked the, the Tathagata, Suganda Kuta, Lord! Where is there such a great being as this? Where is this universe Saha? What does it mean by those who inspire to inferior ways? Having thus been questioned by those bodhisattvas, the Tathagata Suganda Kuta said, Noble ones, the universe Saha exists beyond as many Buddha lands in the direction of the Nadir, as there are sands in 42 Ganges rivers. There, the Tathagata Shakyamuni teaches the Dharma to living beings who aspire to inferior ways. In that Buddha land, which is tainted with the five corruptions of lifespan, drishtis, or views, klesha defilements, sattvic being, and kalpas, time. There, the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti, who lives in the inconceivable liberation, teaches the Dharma to the Bodhisattvas. He sends this incarnation Bodhisattva here in order to celebrate my name, in order to show the advantages of this universe, and in order to increase the roots of virtues of all those Bodhisattvas. The Bodhisattvas exclaimed, how great must that Bodhisattva be himself if his magical incarnation is thus endowed with such supernatural power, strength, and fearlessness? The Tathagata Suganda Kuta said, The greatness of that Bodhisattva Vimalakirti is such 
that he sends magical incarnations to all the Buddha lands of the Ten Directions. And all these incarnations accomplish the work of the Buddha for all the living beings in all those Buddha lands. Then the Tathagata, Suganda Kuta, poured some of his food, impregnated with all perfumes, into a fragrant vessel and gave it to the incarnation bodhisattva. And the 90 million bodhisattvas of that universe volunteered to go along with him. Lord, we also would like to go to that universe, Saha, to see and honor and serve the Buddha Shakyamuni and to see Vimalakirti and all those bodhisattvas. The Tathagata declared, Noble ones, go ahead if you think it is the right time. But lest those living beings become mad and intoxicated, go without your perfumes. And lest those living beings of the Saha world become jealous of you, change your bodies to hide your great beauty. And do not conceive ideas of contempt and aversion for that universe, Saha. Why? Noble ones, a Buddha land is a field of pure space. But the Lord Buddhas, in order to develop living beings, do not reveal all at once the pure realm of the Buddhas. Then the incarnation bodhisattva took the vessel of food and departed with the 90 million bodhisattvas. And by the power of the Buddha and the supernatural operation of Vimalakirti, they disappeared from that universe, Sarvaganda Suganda, and stood again in the house of Vimalakirti in a fraction of a second. The Lichavi Vimalakirti greeted, or sorry, the Lichavi Vimalakirti created. 90 million lion thrones, exactly like those already there. And the bodhisattvas were all seated. Then the incarnation bodhisattva gave the vessel of food to Vimalakirti. And the fragrance of that food permeated the entire great city of Vaishali. And its sweet perfume spread throughout 100 universes. Within the city of Vaishali, the Brahmins, householders, and even the Lichavi chieftain Chandra Chatra, having noticed this fragrance, were amazed and filled with wonder. They were so cleansed in body and mind that they came at once to the house of Imalakirti, along with all 84,000 of the Lichavis. Seeing there the Bodhisattvas seated on their high, wide, and beautiful lion thrones, they were filled with admiration and great joy. They all bowed down to those great disciples and bodhisattvas and then sat down to one side. And then the gods of the earth, the gods of the realm of desire, and the gods of the material realm, attracted by the perfume, also came to the house of Vimalakirti. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti spoke to the elder Shariputra and all the great disciples. Venerables, eat, eat of the food of the Tathagata. It is ambrosia perfumed by great compassion. But do not fix your minds in narrow attitudes about food, lest you are unable to receive this gift. But some of the disciples had already had that thought. And they thought, how can such a huge multitude of people eat such a small amount of food. Then the incarnation bodhisattva said to those disciples who had that thought, do not compare, venerable ones, your own wisdom and merits with the wisdom and the merits of the Tathagata. Why? For example, the four great oceans might dry up, but this food, would never be exhausted. 
if all living beings were to eat for a culpa, an amount of this food equal to Mount Sumeru in size, it still would not be depleted. Why? Issued from inexhaust inexhaustible discipline, meditation, and wisdom, the remains of the food of the Tathagata contained in this vessel cannot be exhausted. Indeed, the entire gathering was satisfied by that food, and the food was not at all depleted. Having eaten that food, there arose in the bodies of those bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas the disciples, the chakra gods, the brahma gods, the lokapala gods, and all the other living beings, there arose a bliss just like the bliss of the bodhisattvas in the universe, universe Sarva Sukha Mandita. And from all the pores of their skin arose a perfume like that of the trees that grow in the universe Sarva Ganda Suganda. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti knowingly addressed those bodhisattvas who had come from the Buddha land of the Lord Tathagata Suganda Kuta. Noble ones, how does the Tathagata Suganda Kuta teach the Dharma? Those bodhisattvas replied, Oh, the Tathagata does not teach the Dharma by means of sound and language. The Buddha disciplines the bodhisattvas only by means of perfumes. At the foot of each perfume tree sits a bodhisattva. And the trees emit perfumes like this one. From the moment they smell that perfume, the bodhisattvas attain a concentration called source of all virtues of all bodhisattvas. And from the moment they attain that concentration, all the virtues of all bodhisattvas are produced in them. Those bodhisattvas of the land, Sarvaganda Suganda, then asked the Licha Vivimalakirti, and how does the Buddha Shakyamuni teach the Dharma here in the Saha world? Vimalakirti replied, Noble ones, these living beings here are hard to discipline. Therefore, he teaches them with discourses appropriate for the disciplining of the wild and the uncivilized. How does he discipline the wild and the uncivilized? What discourses are appropriate for the wild and the uncivilized? Here they are. He says, this is hell. This is the animal world. This is the world of the Lord of death, Mara. These are the adversities. These are the rebirths with crippled faculties. These are physical misdeeds, and these are the retributions for physical misdeeds. These are verbal misdeeds, and these are the retributions for verbal misdeeds. These are mental misdeeds, and these are the retributions for mental misdeeds. This is killing. This is stealing. This is sexual misconduct. This is lying. This is backbiting. This is harsh speech. This is frivolous speech. This is covetedness. This is malice. That's a false view. These are all, these are their retributions. This is miserliness, and this is its effect. This is immortality. This is hatred. This is sloth. This is the fruit of sloth. This is false wisdom, and this is the fruit of false wisdom. These are the transgressions of the precepts. This is the vow of personal liberation. This should be done, and that should not be done. This is proper and that should be abandoned. This is an obstruction, and that is without obstruction. This is sin, and that arises, that rises above sin. This is the path, that's the wrong path. This is virtue, that's evil. This is blameworthy, that's blameless. This is defiled, that's immaculate. This is mundane, that's transcendental. This is compounded, that's uncompounded. This is passion, and that's purification. This is life, and that's liberation. Thus, by means of these varied explanations of the Dharma, the Buddha trains the minds of those living beings who are just like wild horses. 
Just as wild horses or wild elephants will not be tamed unless the goad pierces them to the marrow, so living beings who are wild and hard to civilize are disciplined only by means of discourses about all kinds of miseries. The bodhisattvas from the world Sarvaganda Suganda said, thus is established the greatness of the Buddha Shakyamuni. It is marvelous how concealing his miraculous power, he civilizes the wild living beings. And the bodhisattvas who settle in a Buddha land of such intense hardship, why, they must have inconceivably great compassion. The Lichavi Vimalakirti declared, so it is, good ones, so it is. It is just as you say. The great compassion of the bodhisattvas who reincarnate here in the Saha world is extremely firm. In a single lifetime in this universe, they accomplish much benefit for living beings. So much benefit for living beings could not be accomplished in the universe, Sarva Ganda Suganda. Even in 100,000 kalpas. And why? Because in this Saha universe, there are 10 virtuous practices which do not exist in any other Buddha land. And what are these 10 practices? Here they are. To win over the poor with generosity. To win over the immoral by moral discipline. To win over the hateful by means of patient tolerance. To win over the lazy by means of effort and drive. To win over the mentally troubled by means of meditation. To win over the falsely wise by means of true wisdom, prajna. To show those suffering from the eight adversities how to rise above the eight adversities. To teach the Mahayana to those of narrow-minded behavior. To win over those who have not produced the roots of virtue by means of the roots of virtue. And to cultivate and develop living beings without interruption through the four means of unification. Those who engage in these 10 virtuous practices do not exist in any other Buddha land. Again, the Bodhisattvas asked, how many qualities must a Bodhisattva have to go safe and sound to a pure land after transmigrating at death away from this Saha universe? Vimalakirti replied, after a Bodhisattva transmigrates at death away from this Saha world, there are eight qualities necessary to reach a pure Buddha land, safe and sound. What are the eight? They must resolve to themselves saying, I must benefit all living beings without seeking even the slightest benefit for myself. I must bear all the miseries of all living beings and give all my accumulated roots of virtue to all living beings. I must have no resentment toward any living being. I must rejoice in all bodhisattvas as if they were the Buddha. I must not neglect any teachings, whether or not I have heard them before. I must control my mind without coveting the gains of others and without taking pride in gains of my own. I must examine my own faults and not blame others for their faults. I must take pleasure in being consciously aware and must truly undertake all virtues. If bodhisattvas have these eight qualities, when, they, when transmigrating at death away from the Saha world, they will go safe and sound to a pure Buddha land. 
And when the Lichavivi Malakirti and the Crown Prince Manjushri had thus taught the Dharma to the multitude gathered, 100,000 living beings conceived the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. And 10,000 bodhisattvas attained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. Okay, that's chapter 10. Uh, comments, uh, epiphanies, questions, ideas. I have a question. Um, oh, oh. Oh, Parham, you can go first. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, basically the question is like if I'm if I'm reading this right, when the when the perfume universe bodhisattvas ask Vimalakirti how Shakyamuni teaches the the Dharma in the Saha you know, or like to Saha beings. Does he, is it right, like in the section that starts with this is hell and ends with the duality, like this is life and that's liberation? Is that whole bit basically him saying that, um, like he teaches them Hinayana? Yep. Uh -huh. Perfect. Exactly. That okay. is exactly what's going on there. Is it saying that to start all beings off <laughs> to tame the wild, uh -huh. he teaches them all four noble truths no self, the, that, this is sin, that's not, this is that, that's not. And I was hoping everybody heard the echoes of the Dharma doer of non-duality, non mm -hmm. right? So exactly the reading of it, that is exactly what it is. Okay, thanks. Yep, yeah, thank you. Tania. That was actually the same comment that I had. Oh, I'm good. starting to understand how the teachings, like the pedagogy, I guess, is starting to make sense to me, even though it's a little wordy. Mm. I think I'm on, on that note, you know, there's so, you know, there's a lot going on with these perfumes, of course. A lot of wonderful upaya going on there. One of the things that I like to share as far as the perfume idea goes that's helpful is there's like, if you think about like, well, if you're familiar with the idea of dependent origination that we talked about, pratitya samudpata, all things being dependently originated based on other things, all other things actually, right? And because of the dependently originated nature of all phenomena, all individual phenomena unto themselves are rather kind of empty in that way. They are not. They're all kind of dependently originated. What there's a way, and I'm going to just have to kind of say this bluntly, but there's a way that Buddhist sutras start, start talking about all phenomena having the same smell or the same taste. It all tastes dependently originated to me, right? Yeah. It, all smell, it all smells a little dependently originated, right? That is a, 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 a flavor, if I may, a flavor for what's going on here with this metaphor where these teachings are so subtle and because we've already ruled out in a way, you know, language as a I mean, it can be a discursive tool, but at a certain point, it needs to be abandoned, right? But there's still this way where, like, you know, it, it, this Dharma, it, it has a feeling to it. It has a vibe. It's got a smell. It has a flavor. It has a taste. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it makes me feel a certain way or something. All, all of that is, is in this chapter. This beautiful, beautiful chapter about teaching bodhisattvas using smells rather than, you know, words and language and stuff. But also to this beautiful reversal, right? Where, you know, we here think, oh, that must be paradise, 
where they have like perfume trees and I, I just learn by, by smelling and it's like, wow, that must be heaven. But then they come here and they're like, wow, that's crazy. What? The Buddha teaches what? And so it's, you know, if you go back to the first chapter where Shariputra was like, why is the world so messed up? Right? And then the Buddha, you know, he touches his big toe to the earth and transforms it before Shariputra's eyes. And he's like, wow, I didn't ever really realize it was this great here. So the, I, I said this when we first met, when we first started meeting, I said that the first chapter of this contains the whole sutra. Like the whole sutra happens in the first chapter. It happened again in that way. So, but I digress. Further questions, comments? I, I do have a lot more to share tonight, but I do want to hear any reactions to that beautiful chapter. Other, in other words, Sugand, the Suganda uh, Kuta saga continues. So it ain't over. But in case anybody's totally lost. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree. Because I, this, again, this was, I, and I hope everybody got to my comment about, you know, that we've put in the hard work, right? That that, that chapter was all, I mean, Tania said it was a little wordy in that way, but, you know, it's all, you either, it's kind of either get it or you don't. There's no kind of midway between it in that way. And so either the, you're, you're smelling it and it's smelling good or, you, you know, so again, the, the fun continues though. So surprise, chapter 11, um, we, we got to do it because again, this is the penultimate class. So we only have one more chapter 12 next, uh, next Sunday. So we got to do chapter 11. So uh, also note too, in our recap, the very beginning, the Buddha says, hey, Shari Putra, why don't you, why don't you go check on uh, Vimala Kirti? No, thanks. All the way to the Bodhisattvas. When everybody goes to Vimala Kirti's house, the Buddha didn't go. The Buddha was hanging back in the Amrapali garden, right? So, meanwhile, the area in which the Buddha was teaching the Dharma in the garden of Amrapali, it expanded and grew larger, and the entire assembly appeared tinged with a golden hue. Thereupon, the venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Lord, this expansion and enlargement of the garden Amrapali and this golden hue of the entire assembly, what do these auspicious signs portend? The Buddha declared, Ananda, these auspicious signs portend that the Lichavi Vimalakirti and the Crown Prince Manjushri, attended by a great multitude, are coming into the presence of the Tathagata. At that very moment, the Lichavi Vimalakirti said to the Crown Prince Manjushri, Hey Manjushri, let us take these many living beings into the presence of the Lord, so that they may see the Tathagata and bow down to him. Manjushri replied, Noble sir, send them if you feel the time is right. Thereupon, the Lichavi Vimalakirti performed the miraculous feat of placing the entire assembly replete with thrones upon his right hand. And then, having transported himself magically into the presence of the Buddha, placing it on the ground in front of him, he bowed down at the feet of the Buddha, circumambulated him to the right seven times with his palms placed together, and then withdrew to one side. The bodhisattvas who had come from the Buddha land of the Tathagata Sugandakuta descended from their lion thrones and, bowing down at the feet of the Buddha, placed their palms together in reverence and withdrew to one side. 
and the other bodhisattvas, great spiritual heroes and the great disciples descended from their thrones likewise, and having bowed at the feet of the Buddha, withdrew to one side. Likewise, all of those injured gods and Brahma gods and Lokapala gods and other gods bowed down at the feet of the Buddha and withdrew to one side. Then the Buddha, having delighted those bodhisattvas with greetings, declared, Noble ones, be seated upon your thrones. Thus commanded by the Buddha, they took their thrones. The Buddha said to Shariputra, Shariputra, did you see the miraculous performances of the bodhisattvas, those best of beings? I have seen them, Lord. What concept did you produce toward them? Lord, I produce the concept of inconceivability toward them. Their activities appeared inconceivable to me, to the point that I was unable to think of them, to judge them, or even to imagine them. Then the Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, Lord, what is this perfume, the likes of which I have never smelled before? The Buddha answered, Ananda, this same perfume emanates from all our pores as well. Ananda asked, where does the perfume come from? Shariputra replied, the Lichavi Vimalakirti obtained some food from the universe called Sarvaganda Suganda, the Buddha land of the Tathagata Suganda Kuta, and the perfume emanates from the bodies of all those who partook of that food. Then the Venerable Ananda addressed the Lichavi Vimalakirti, how long will this perfume remain? The Malakirti replied, until it is digested. Ananda replied, when will it be digested? The Malakirti replied, it will be digested in 49 days. And its perfume will emanate for seven days more after that. But there will be no trouble of indigestion during that time. Okay, I'm going to pause there because I do want to go a few ahead a little bit. Questions? All right. So, yeah, just for the sake of time, because I do want to uh, get to something, of course. Um, so Anand is like, this is great, right? This is, Lord, this is wonderful. This is great that, the, that this food, this weird food, Perfume food, it's crazy, right? That it accomplishes the work of the Buddha, right? So it is, it's so wonderful. He says, Ananda, this is a vimoksha, this is a dharma door called introduction to all the qualities of the Buddha. The bodhisattva who enters this dharma door experiences neither joy nor pride when confronted by a Buddha land adorned with the splendor of all noble qualities and experiences neither sadness nor aversion when confronted by a Buddha land apparently without that splendor, but in all cases produces a profound reverence for all the Tathagatas, right? Okay, I'm also skipping an interesting part about the difference between Samyak Sambuddhas, Tathagatas, and Buddhas, these words, these names. I thought I might be able to get there, so our Tathagata shot was going to be extra spicy, but I'm not, I'm going to have to skip that. I'm just jumping down to the end of page 87, if you're on that page. Then, all those bodhisattvas from the Buddha land of the Tathagata, Sugandakuta, join their palms in reverence and saluting the Tathagata Shakyamuni addressed him as follows. Lord, when we first arrived in this Buddha land, we conceived a negative idea, but we now abandon that wrong idea. Why? Lord, the realms of the Buddhas and their upaya, their skillful means, are inconceivable. 
in order to develop living beings, they manifest such and such a field to suit the desires of such and such living beings. Lord, would you please give us a teaching by which we may remember you? So that we may remember you when we have returned to Sarvaganda Suganda land. Thus, having been requested, the Buddha declared, Noble ones, there is a vimoksha, there is a liberation of bodhisattvas called destructible and indestructible. You must train yourselves in this liberation. What is it? Destructible refers to compounded things, molecular structures, compounded things. Indestructible refers to the uncompounded, uncompounded, the asamskrita. But the bodhisattva should neither destroy the compounded nor rest in the uncompounded. To not destroy the compounded, to not destroy compounded things, consists in not losing sight of the great love, not giving up the great compassion, not forgetting the omniscient mind generated by high resolve. And then a whole page of further things to do in order to not destroy compounded things. One moment, and then we're going to recap. I'm actually going to walk us through the board. But then, what is to not rest in the uncompounded? There, the Bodhisattva practices emptiness, but does not realize emptiness. She practices signlessness, but does not realize signlessness. She practices wishlessness, but does not realize wishlessness. She practices non-action, but does not realize non-action. And then a whole big giant paragraph of what the Bodhisattva doesn't do in that regard. All right. Um, yeah, and then at the end of that chapter, then those Bodhisattvas, having heard this teaching, were satisfied, delighted, and reverent. They were filled with rejoicing and happiness of mind. And in order to worship the Buddha Shakyamuni and the Bodhisattvas of the Saha world, as well as this teaching, they covered the whole earth of this billion-fold world system with fragrant powder, incense, perfumes, and flowers up to the height of their knees, having thus regaled the whole retinue of the Tathagata. They bowed their heads at the feet of the Buddha, circumambulated him to the right three times. They sang a hymn of praise to him. They then disappeared from this universe in a split of a second and were back in the universe. Sarva Ganda Suganda. Okay. So, a very quick destructible, indestructible, but I do want to touch on it again in my own, in my own words. Um, but before that, any, any questions, comments, anything come up? Cool. Um, let, me, um, let me walk you through my whiteboard real quick. Totally corresponds to the chapter. It's a good review. Um, on this side, we have the 10 paramitas. This is, I talked a lot about it, I think, even our, the first night. It kind of fell to the background. Now it's back to the foreground. Um, you, you may have only be familiar with the six paramitas. Uh, it's the, that's sort of more common to hear about the six paramitas, which are the, the first six of these 10. But actually within the scope of the sutra, within the scope of the inconceivable sutras, there's 10. A really quick note about this word paramita, uh, usually translated as perfection, like the pranya paramita. Pranya is wisdom, but like 
not just regular wisdom, it's like super wisdom. So they speak of pranya as a paramita. And so then you might hear the perfection of wisdom, perfect wisdom. It's unfortunate because it's not really at all what paramita means. And then it's totally misleading because you get totally wrapped up in ideas of perfect and imperfect. And you got to walk through the Dharma do a non-duality again and it starts all over. So it's more helpful to know that the para, para means like um, uh, to cross, to go beyond. And then mita is like, it kind of makes that into a device of um, something that gets one beyond. And traditionally, what a paramita was is that in the original Buddhist formula of samsara and nirvana, and there was the sea of transmigration that separated samsara from nirvana, well, a paramita was something that could ferry you over to nirvana. So a paramita is a, uh, I like to translate paramita as deliverance deliverance by wisdom deliverance through giving deliverance delivering you to nirvana deliverance is a little tricky though transcendence is a little tricky too because again the bodhisattvas told us trans transcendent mundane so it all gets a little tricky but the paramitas are these practices of bodhisattvas to achieve well supreme unsurpassable enlightenment the first paramita is dana, giving. And this sutra and many of the inconceivable sutras, dana is one of the four samgraha vastu, the means of unification. This is a really interesting idea that more people need to be talking about in Mahayana Buddhism, which is that this kind of... Um, uh, Quadrafecta, quadfecta, is that a, the word, right? This four uh, grouping here are the means to unification, giving, which is the paramita, and then kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation. So that's sort of all the first paramita. You can even think of kind speech as a form of giving, volunteerism, of course, as a way of giving and cooperation as a way of giving. So it's why they all sort of fall together. The second paramita is discipline, shila, moral discipline. Traditionally, this is following the precepts, following the code, the do's and don'ts of Buddhism. But discipline can also be about, you know, discipline, you know, not being lazy, not being, you know, having a you know, being disciplined. So that's loose in terms of how you define it if you're a monk or a householder. Kushanti, patient tolerance. This is number three, the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. That's Kushanti. Virya. I like to translate Virya as drive. Some people do determination. Some people do effort. But it is a kind of energy, a kind of drive. And, and virya is very much the opposite of laziness. And I want you to kind of know that, you know, of course, all of these things are cultivated. And, and they're cultivated by, by doing it, right? How, how do you cultivate giving? You do it, right? <laughs> so all of these are, are in working that way. Dhyana, number five, dhyana, of course, is our meditation. But the particular type of sati, mindfulness, calming, absorption type meditation. Number six is wisdom, pranya. And in many ways, Manjushri, who is the bodhisattva of pranya, I've kind of color coded this in a way. Pranya is like the purple robe of the paramitas. It really stands as like if, 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 if you have pranya, Duh, giving. Duh, following the rules. Duh, patience. It's like pranya wisdom. The, the rest of the paramitas become obs, ob, super obvi, right? 
So those are the six paramitas that you were, might be used to with these like 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D, right? Then there's these four um, paramitas that are really what this sutra is focusing on. Because in many ways, even the Shravakas, they know about the six paramitas. They're in the Theravada tradition. These are a little unique. Number seven is Upaya. We've been talking about Upaya for seven weeks. This is skillful means. This is pedagogy. This is Upaya. This is that idea, right, of teaching, skillful means. But it, skillful means can also be skillful giving, right? Giving a, giving a millionaire a bunch of money might not be the most skillful way of giving, right? <laughs> it might not be, right? So think of that when you think of upaya, skillful means, but I also want you to think of the poetry, the beauty, that's all, po that's all upaya, all that. Number eight, I meant to mention during my recap, this is pranidana. Pranidana, it was basically that when uh, the thrones showed up from this other Buddha, Maru Pradiparaja, right? And we're and Shariputra's like Maru who, what? Like I I don't know Maru, and Val Vimalakirti says, oh, if you you just surrender yourself to Maru Pradiparaja, just Pranidana. He teaches him that uh, paramita, just surrender yourself to the Tathagata then you can sit on the thrones. So pranidana is this kind of surrender, Islam, a kind of, um, uh, it also can be translated as vow, a V-O-W, vow, but it's kind of like a wedding vow to the Bodhisattva, I mean, to the Buddha, where it's like an I do. Like, do you take this Buddha to be your Buddha? I do. <laughs> That's a uh, pranidana, that's the vow. And what's fascinating, if, you, if I wanted to just do it this way, which why not? Recapping the thrones, how do I sit on my giant throne? Well, I need to pranidana, surrender myself to the Tathagata, and I thereby get the bala. Bala is spiritual power, the ability to grow my body. Now, I have my monk here. He's got his third eye shooting. He's making a chi ball. All of that, of course, is wrapped up in the powers. We spent a whole night talking about the superpowers. So there's that. It's both, you know, reading other people's minds or whatever, but also the ability to sit on a throne that's 84,000 miles high, right? And then finally, and this is in a certain way progressive, meaning that it kind of starts with giving. It's, it's how you like get in the door. And there's a certain way in which this is progressive, getting up to, med, uh, to, to wisdom. Then because you have the wisdom, you're able to employ upaya. You're smart enough to surrender yourself to the thagata. You get the power culminating in number 10, jnana. Sometimes uh, it's, it's just knowledge sometimes uh, like a transcendent knowledge because it's kind of, well, it's a special bodhisattva kind of knowledge, right? So those are the 10 paramitas. Any questions about those real quick? Is that what, I'm sorry, is that what uh, Thurman translates as gnosis? Yes, uh -huh. yes. It's like esoteric knowledge or something. Yeah, yeah. And so he does that kind of like, you know, uh, theosophy thing of calling it gnosis. Um, yeah, and, and I kind of, you know, jnana is a tricky one, but I like to point out that in Buddhism or, you know, in our Dharma talks, we talk a lot about uh, vijnana or vijnana. So that's like discriminative consciousness, kind of vijnana. We talk about samjnana or just samnya. That's kind of associative jnana. We talk about pranya, pranyana, right? Higher knowledge. Well, all of those jnanas have prefixes. They have qualifiers. Well, this is just <laughs> jnana. It's like just raw, raw jnana. So that's kind of a wild idea.
and yeah, Gnosis. Quickly too, I wrote out on the side of the board, these are the eight liberations, the eight Vimoksha. When I did my talk on chapter six, the inconceivable liberation, I talked at length about Vimoksha or what this idea of liberation means. And I also talked a lot about these, like how this number eight pops up a lot. And there are traditionally these eight liberations, but then there's eight other liberations, and then there's these eight superpowers, and then there's all these eights. And then at a certain point, the sutra sort of drops on us that like the eightfold path is the eight liberations kind of, and you're kind of like, oh, that's crazy. So I just wanted to walk you through like what is traditionally the eight liberations. And I did it once real quickly, but just to contextualize this side of the board. Um, well, this whole thing sort of corresponds to dhyana as a paramita and bala, because we're talking about meditation, absorption, contemplations resulting in uh, bala, okay? Well, actually resulting in liberation, nirodha. The first of these is, and is as simple as it is, it's just form seeing form. That's it. Bo all Buddhists are like, yeah, that's what's going on. <laughs> that, that's that's what the deal is. It's, it's uh, rupa meets rupa. <laughs> like, that's it. But actually, the first vimoksha, the first liberation, that's very subtle. Actually, that that it's form encountering form, and if if you get into the subtler meanings of what rupa or form means, like shape, so it's like one shape encountering another shape. It's all very subtle, but that sort of understanding of rupa meeting rupa is the first, so that it gives way to the formless, basically. So we have form, and now we have the formless realm. So this idea of the formless, the formless liberation or meditation on formlessness gives way to mudita, the joy, the joy of the goddess. And I actually wanted to tie this together, that so much about chapter uh, seven, the goddess chapter, I didn't say this, and I meant to, so I'm saying it now, Another way to read that chapter is that it's all about mudita, it's all about joy, and it's a critique of Theravada meditation being joyless. It's a critique of Theravadans being like, just totally stoic, you know? And it's like, yo, have some fun, dude. So that, chapter the flowers and all of that it's a lot about joy and having fun with med not fun with meditation but receiving joy from it so that's the third vimoksha when it's like joyful that gives away to classic the akasha ayatana infinite space this is not formlessness this is space different right space of course, in classic uh, fashion gives way to infinite consciousness. Infinite consciousness gives away to naiva samya ni samya, neither samya nor no samya, neither with perception nor without perception, a neither nor kind of a state. And the eighth and final vimoksha liberation is nirodha. The extinction, cessation of suffering, clinging, wanting, desire, defilements. You take your choice of language, but that idea, that's the, the end goal. And that is, gets you into the Amrapali garden, right? That's access to the garden. So that takes us all the way through the board, all the way through. I said everything I came to say. Questions, answers, comments. We have a few moments. Not really. Time's passed. But <laughs> All right, folks. I'm going to just call it there because we are past time. Um, 
again, it was just, it was a bedtime story, you know, really. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and I'll see you for the last installment of the experience next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for being here. Peace, Michael. Um, Thank you, Michael. Thanks, two things Michael. to let you guys know about before you go. Um, one is that if you have missed any of these, uh, it's a good time to catch up before next week. So you can go to our YouTube channel and they're all on there. Um, and in addition to the, I'm getting you the link now. Um, in addition to what we're doing here on Sunday nights, Michael Taft has been doing an amazing series of guided meditations on Thursday nights that complement these. And I think it was the first in that series, he kicked off the series by letting everyone know that they're allowed to have fun while they're meditating. <laughs> and even that uh, was, was liberating for some of us. Uh, and then I wanna talk about Donna. And you know, we talked about how uh, the practice of giving, the practice of Donna is the entry into all of these other paramitas. And one thing that struck me a lot was um, Donna as a means of unification, because that is what our Sangha is. Um, it's an all volunteer Sangha that runs on contributions from all of us. Um, so people are donating, freely giving their time. Fr the teaching is freely offered in exchange for Donna. Um, and there's this beautiful connection that happens in the community when resources are freely given from a place of joy and a feeling of abundance. And so I would ask you if you're feeling that place of abundance and joy tonight to please share some of it uh, with the community as a further way of giving and keeping us together. Um, and if you are not, then, um, then don't, but keep coming back. We as a Sangha are committed to never putting a financial barrier between people and the Dharma. So we want everyone to be here in this community of shared resources um, that will be self-sustaining, hopefully long into the future. Two more things. <laughs> One thing is that um, if you have deeper questions or are interested in doing a deeper reading of any sutra or studying the Dharma in a deeper way with MC Owens. Um, you could go to his website. He does tutoring um, and sutra study one-on-one. -on -one. And I know I always in these classes come up with like probably like seven hours worth of questions that I could ask. So if you're having that experience to check out the website. Um, and then some of you probably heard, I don't know if everyone's heard, but we made the difficult but ultimately um, pragmatic decision to give up our physical space um, on Folsom Street. And our plan is to move into a new space in the mission when we're allowed to gather again. We don't know when that will be, um, but we will have a new space in the mission in the future. We're paying rent through June 1st, um, and then we are liberated from our uh, obligation to the physical space. But tonight we're gathering here at this, uh, not tonight, Friday night. <laughs> what is time? Um, Friday night will be at this same link in this same Zoom room from 7 to 8.30, uh, having a kind of free form sharing memories of the space, um, talking about you know things that happened there the community that we started out of that space and anything else that you want to share about the space or your kind of hopes and dreams for the sangha um, for the future so that's this friday the 22nd at seven o'clock here um, so if you're having feelings about the space that you want to talk about um, i have both laughed and cried about this decision and i want to share some of that with you all so come on friday uh, to talk about that and uh, with that, I, I just want to say again, thank you, Michael. This has been so fun. Uh, and I'll see you back here next week. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Michael. Good night, Michael. Good night, everyone. So good to see everyone. Tanya.